Good morning and Christian greetings to each one that is here. That, uh, that was powerful. That, that is the essence of Christianity is how we reflect what God has done for us and inject into society. That, that's very powerful. I, I appreciate that very much. That could be a message. Maybe we should just talk about that. Maybe we will. I would like to uh, read a passage of Scripture this morning that we're all familiar with, but uh, I like to read first because I, I can easily get carried away uh, by it, just talking if I don't watch what I do. I, I miss reading and, and don't get it done like I should. I, I want to welcome each one of you. It does seem like our house, uh, church house is a bit empty this morning, but uh, be that as it may, we are here to worship a powerful God, a God that has a plan for each one of us and loves each one of us. I'd like to read from the, uh, I call it the lost and found chapter in Luke 15, the first seven verses, and you know where I'm going with this, probably, for those of you that are Bible readers. Uh, I don't know if you're comfortable to stand. If you had enough donuts and coffee to stay awake, maybe you would stand um, so you don't fall asleep in the first 15 minutes here. I'm going to read from verse 1. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him, and the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, what man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. I'm going to quit reading. You can be seated if you like. I don't know if I need to say more than that, actually. I think we understand well the context, the thrust of what Jesus was saying in this parable um, and But I, I'm going to kind of camp on, on that this morning. I'm going to think about the, something that was expressed in this, in what I uh, read, that it wasn't, actually, it wasn't actually written about. There's a word that I would kind of use to sum up what was happening here, the activity in this parable that wasn't actually mentioned. Maybe someone can help me. I don't know what you think of this passage. What was it? Well, I'll just tell you, I didn't come to do a, a test. The love of God. The love of God was kind of radiates from this passage. As I think of this lost sheep, single sheep, out on a mountain, and the shepherd leaving the comfort of his the sheep, where he was, and going out on the mountain to rescue this sheep. And this, well, let me just uh, talk to you about how I've titled this. I've titled this message, When Love Does, Love Wins. And I, I'll have to explain this so that you understand where I'm coming from. I'm reading currently a book written by Bob Goff that is simply titled Love Does. And I thought when I started to read the book that well, when I was thinking of reading the book, that maybe he would explain to me how love works out and how it's supposed to work and, and ends up, he's just kind of a man that tells stories and then he, about his own experience and then how love, he says, love does. Love does something. Love is never something that's just sitting on a shelf and I tell you I love you and then it's just that. He says, <coughs> kind of in an Anabaptist fashion, fashion where we say that we put effort or works to our belief, that's what he's saying. Love does something, and then love wins. Well, wasn't really planning on doing this, but uh, I, I think I will. You know, a lot of times, most of the time, 
When there's conflict and confrontation and lack of love, there's something else. When, when there are people that have a hard time getting along with other people, there's something else that is ahead of that. And it's their connection with God that is making them act out in ways that are unhealthy. Now, you may chew that one apart. But I've noticed that there, whenever, when, just like when there's kind of a struggle having a devotional life, there's not much connection with God. The same is true when people don't really understand how much God loves them. And, and they don't feel or sense that love. They start acting out in ways that, that are unhealthy and bring and end up in bad relationships. This is something that my, I'm going to read this to you. I'm, uh, my daughter-in-law wrote this. This is our theme of the year at our business. And so what, what that entails, what that means is I'll end up, every group, I'll read this uh, to the group as we end our, our tour. But this is what she wrote, and it's a reminder that we're instructed to love, but we have someone, we, meaning all of us, have someone that deeply loves us, deeply loves us. Starts out this way, uh, dear soul, it's just me again. I heard your thoughts and worries swirling in your head, too broken, too weak, failure, misfit, unloved, unlovable. I heard it all and it grieved me. How opposite my heart toward you is. Too broken? I will heal your broken because you are loved. Too weak? I will be your strength because you are loved. Failure? I will be your victory because you are loved. Misfit? You always have a place with me because you are loved. Unloved and unlovable, I love you more than you can ever know. Come to me, dear soul, with me no matter what. I will whisper to you the truth of the ages. You are loved. And then she ends up signing it as if our Savior wrote it. And it may, be in a, it may seem like a weak attempt, but I would remind us this morning that even though we're, instru we're instructed by God to love, to love our fellow man, to love as Jesus loved, to be, uh, and this is not a love-only message, I, but I do think it's a part of the message of Jesus. There is, and maybe I'm getting ahead of myself here by saying this now, but I, maybe I'll say it a couple times, there is ample Scripture that says the wrath of God abideth on those that don't do the will of God. I don't know when that wrath will be expressed. I don't know if it'll be the end of time. I don't know how. Sometimes it says that the face of, face of God is against those that don't do his will, and I'm just using my own words. But however, let's get back to the Scripture and, and just kind of bear in mind this morning, we are unable to love others the way Jesus did, unless we get this settled in our mind that we have a Savior that loved us and did so before we ever knew him, before we ever made a move toward him. That's not to say that we can live as we want and God will love us. I'm not, that's not at all, and I'm not here to defend myself on that one. And also, this is a disclaimer. This is not something that I am preaching this morning because I feel like there's a lack of love and I'm finally telling you to start loving. No, I'm here to encourage you to build on what's already here because I, I do see things that, that happen here that I know people are, are loving on each other and doing what they're supposed to. They're welcoming others in. This, back to the passage, this, this really shows the character of God. And, and I referred to this already, but Romans 5, 8, the NIV says, but God demonstrated, demonstrates his own love for us in this, while we were yet sinners, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's a little different. I'm used to reading it in the King James. And so the, the, the context of love from God is that he didn't wait until there was, there was love coming to him he loved us first. We know that. We grew up in church. We've heard that many times. What does that mean to you in 2024, in February of 2024? What does that mean? 
How does that work itself out in our lives? It's what I'd like to talk about. First of all, who do you love the most? Is it your wife, if you're married, who do you think you love the most? We, this could be quite a, a long, um, maybe we could ask questions, we could go back and forth, but who do you think you love the most? Well, I'll just tell you something. I have an unfair bias to love myself. Probably my family would say, yeah, that's pretty accurate. Because I, I feel like what I do, I defend, and if I'm not careful, I, 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 I just end up loving. That's the natural kind of something that we're born with. An unfair bias to love ourselves more than maybe perhaps we should. However... We are people of worth. And so the balance is God does love us. And, well, I'll just leave that. If this is a fruit, if love is a, a Christian fruit, then it means it's something that will grow. And with time, and this is something I like about the book that, that someone else wrote the foreword, and he said there's something about Bob, the author, that as time has gone on, he has such a loving way of handling people. He it just seems to flow naturally. Well, I'm here to tell you it doesn't flow naturally. It, it is something that we have to work for. And probably this is a message that many of us have heard many, many times, that we ought to love each other. But the one thing that we haven't heard a lot is that conviction that when love is missing, it's a, it's a heaven or hell issue. When, when the people of God say they love, but they don't love, it's a heaven or hell issue. Now, maybe we've had veiled references to that. We, it, it, we can maybe say it this way, that we, we lose our salvation if we fail to love as we ought to love. And I'll leave it at that. Something else I'd like to talk about here is as you probably read this and thought about it, I'd like to talk a little bit about number 100. Number 100 was out on the mountain. Number 100 had no way back home. Number 100 was lost unless someone was there to reach out a hand. And I like to think about the misconception of who number 100 is. I think we, in our Christian circles, in our, we've heard this since we were babies, kind of have this feeling that number 100 is probably someone that never heard about God or has failed miserably or is out there and just from a rough background. But let me tell you this morning, we are all number 100. If we think somehow, if we have this ideology that it must be that number one is still someone else, all of us somewhere, sometime, we're number 100. We may not think that way. We may feel kind of proud about our background or where we come from, but it's not true. God had to rescue all of us. Otherwise, we wouldn't be in the fold. And so that means that it, it kind of, it makes me look at this differently. You know, sometimes, and I, I don't know how to, to say this, but sometimes number 100 sits in the church pews and is lost on the mountain because of their egos and pride that they walk in the church with. And I hate to say it that way, but that happens. And the, the self-righteousness and egos will will keep us on that mountain. And I'll just tell you this, this sort of number 100 pushes back harder than the one that knows. I've spoken to people that have not been not committed their lives to the Lord at all, and they were open and said they acknowledged that they needed God, but they weren't ready to do it. Sometimes those that are by the wayside, because of their egos, because of their pride, are harder to reach than actually the lost sheep on the mountain. Also, I, number 100, when it does come back, it is our responsibility 
And I know he's talking about sheep, but he's using sheep as an illustration of, I think, how the church and the kingdom of God ought to function. When, the, when number 100 comes back, how is number 100 accepted in the fold? They don't smell quite right. They don't dress quite right. They don't, they just really messed up. And so when they finally come to church or come back to the fold, we have to hold them at arm's length. And I know there's a time of building confidence, but you know, I felt later on in the chapter, it talks about the lost son, the, the well, you know the chapter, but it seems like sometimes the number 100 coming back to the fold or someone that has a, a, maybe a deep confession to make is kind of held like, I call it older brother syndrome, like you have to prove yourself. I want to see if you're serious about it. And in, instead of building confidence, we still kind of do this. And I think God will hold us accountable. I think the, the Paul and Romans... One of the things that maybe we think about often is that we have to tell people that they need to repent. We have to get after them harder. We have to say it more seriously. We have to, we have to just show them that we have the answers and they need to hear it. And I like the verse that Paul has in, in uh, Romans uh, chapter 2, verse 4. It is the goodness of God that leadeth to repentance. The strength of the love of God is a holding power. It is the greatest holding power on earth as far as holding people in the kingdom. You know, when God's people taste of his goodness, they don't want to leave. And it is not in my power to, to make it harsh enough to bring people to repentance. It is only when that reflection of God's glory flows through God's people and we become channels, that is the holding power. And I, want to, I think that is very important for us to realize that it's not in our ability to make it harsh enough, to, to say it harsh enough. It doesn't mean that we don't speak up, absolutely not. But it, it is not our ability to do that. Something that happened in this parable that might... I always like to think about the audience that Jesus had. He was talking to the sinners. He was talking to the, um, uh, the scribes and Pharisees. He was talking to the, uh, if I, let me just, well, it was the sinners and it was the publicans. And I don't know why those two were lumped together, but the scribes and Pharisees were listening from the kind of outside edge, the outskirts. And, and they were there just ready to, they said, they alluded to the fact that that Jesus is at the table with the sinners. He is not afraid of, of mixing and mingling with the sinners. And I think sometimes they, I, I think they were so programmed that they would not be seen with sinners that they, they felt like these sinners could just kind of be, they didn't want to be seen with them. And I'd like to talk just a little bit about the back pew and I don't know if no one's sitting on the back pew today, so I can speak freely. I had a local businessman um, talk to me recently, and, and he, he said he, he was in a situation where there was someone at their place of business, and this person was just all broken up. And we live in a hopeless world. We really do. We, if we don't have God, we have really no, not much hope. And I don't know what this situation looked like it doesn't matter but what I want to say is this businessman said I tried I went out this person was sitting in the vehicle in the parking lot just weeping just broken just what next what am I going to do and just told him he went out and he, finally and he said can I help you is there something I can do for you is there a place that we can get you to for help and not knowing what to do. And this, this man is a friend of mine and, and uh, some of you might know him, but uh, I, I listened and, he's, and then he said, I just so 
wanted him to go to a church. And he said, would you allow a person like that to come to your church on a Sunday morning and perhaps just sit on the back pew? And I said, sure. Next time that happens, tell them where we're at. And, and I don't know if I said this, but they don't even have to sit on the back pew. They can sit on the front pew. And I think sometimes we get this idea that number 100 is out there. And so if they come in, they can kind of sit on the fringes because they're not really part of the, the intimate body here. But no, I don't think that's what Jesus wants. And I'm not saying that the back pew shouldn't be occupied. And I often tell visitors that come in the shop, they all kind of want to go to the back. I say, that's oh, just like the Mennonites. They all want the back pew. I think they should all sit, fill up the front pews first, and then they could feel like the preacher does sitting up front. But be that as it may, the, the point is this. When, when and if there is a need, we should not relegate those people to the back pew, as it were. And someone else made this observation about Jesus sitting at the table with sinners. He said, what is it about the table where no one sits in the back? Everyone is equal distance from God. And I think that's, that's the way I feel anyway. It has nothing to do with your distance from me. You're just as close to God as if you were in the front pew. But sometimes in our head, I think at least it's worth noticing Distance isn't that critical, but attitude is very, very critical. And Jesus was very um, straightforward with his, how he handled the, the, the spiritual people of his day. One of the things that, that this 99 and number 100 out there reminded me of is that, that God is not willing that any should perish. And you can read that in, in 2 Peter 3.9. And again, I, the flip side, trying to reconcile that, there's also a verse just a little bit before or after that that talks about the face of God being against those that are against him. And so God doesn't want anyone to perish. But what I see in this parable is simply this, that sometimes we have to walk through some pretty deep things to reach those that are against, against God. The scribes and Pharisees, of course, were uh, used to using force uh, so that they would bring people in or hold people out. And um, I know that sometimes people say we need to get tough with our religion. We need to, we need to use some tough love. And, and I think there is maybe a time for that and drawing lines. I'm not opposed to that, but let's be very careful that we don't do so in an unloving way. And let me just add to that. Sometimes it seems as though egos are involved in situations like that. Let's be careful that we, we never get to this place, that we think that number 100 can just die on the mountain. We'll just keep going. It does a number of things. It, it, it really sets a tone for those that are in the fold to know that if they get out there, they're going to be left to die. No one is going to walk out there and try to rescue them. What love does? What does love actually do? Let's think about this sheep on the mountain now. And, and Jesus is saying, we are that, have been that lost sheep. What do you think happened when that shepherd went calling the sheep? Maybe it was a dark, rainy night. I don't know. Maybe it was a night that, that was... Uh, nice and lots of starlight and, and this. But in any case, I expect, I can just use my imagination. In any case, it's very real, a very real possibility that when Jesus, uh, when this shepherd called that sheep, this little sheep or sheep ran away. Maybe perhaps he spent hours. I know I have. I, I don't have a real high regard for sheep. I know that sheep are used for illustration but I just never had a really good experience herding sheep. It's just because maybe I'm not good at it. or I. But the one time my dad ever bought sheep out of the sale barn, it was so wild. And I, I ran and ran and ran trying to herd it. 
And when I finally got there and got it, it just laid down and looked at me. And I thought, why didn't you do that a long time ago? But, you know, that's kind of what I get in my head when I think about this, this person, this shepherd out on the mountain looking for that, that sheep. And I think that often I have this idea that if, if I am in the business of trying to get people to reconcile with God and helping people, that they're just going to come running in. And it's not usually the case. It takes time. It takes effort. It probably had a self-centered mind, a, a mind of its own. This, this sheep didn't want help. And I think that is God's dilemma often, when, and our dilemma when we are trying to help others find, find God. Maybe this is so elementary it doesn't need to be said, but I think it's very important that we realize that we are all, have all, at times when we needed someone to kind of search us out and walk with us again. Maybe not once, maybe not twice, maybe many times. I like to think just briefly about what love does and what lack of love does. I, why do I even try to say this? This could be 10 messages. This could be on and on and on. This could be a long discussion. But uh, just, I'll just share a few things that, that came to my mind, and I, I'll just kind of let you run this through your head, and, and hopefully it, it sparks something. What does love actually do? What, what does love do? What does lack of love do? Both of them. Instead of love, sometimes we observe a war machine, and I'll explain as a church, this, this could be talked about for a long time. We are responsible to build a, or try to build with the help of God and the Holy Spirit a culture of love. When I say a culture of love, we, when we have a culture of love, we are inviting people in. Our children know that when there are visitors here, they are to, I don't know how to say this, Play with the visitors kindly. The children, they are to, are, it bleeds through. If, we have a, if we're after trying to build a culture of love, we are so focused on, on loving each other. It's kind of reminded me of what Paul Beachy shared when he was here. Maybe the single greatest evangelistic tool that we have is simply loving each other. You, you could tear that one apart too, I guess, but... We need to speak, but we, I think sometimes the most practical things that we do really speak the loudest. Right now, Russia is a war machine. They, are, they up the production of their arms. And in doing so, they are forcing, as it were, the world, other countries to up the production. And you know what's happening is that this hatred's just being elevated. All countries... Around the world, are, all eyes are one side or the other, and there are players in this, and, and they're, they're, some of them are selling uh, through third, or uh, how do they call that? They're funneling through other countries' ammunition to Russia, and they're profiting from the hatred that's... And finally, the bullets end on the front line, and I'm sure that the body bags that go off the front line I, we could talk about this, but let me, let me zoom in to something else. And let me think about the war machine. And, and many times I hear something like this. Next time you need to tell them this. And we're going to have a meeting and we're going to tell them this. With that sinister edge that we are going to, and that is the war machine that goes on in churches and communities that tears down and destroys instead of love. And so I'm, I'm concerned about us being careful that we build each other up whenever we have uh, a chance to. And let me say it this way. Think about it in this way. If the war machine would stop, how much further ahead would the whole world be I'm talking about out there. If we were building commerce, if we were building houses, if we were building whatever, 
How much further is the church ahead when we build each other up rather than tear each other down? And that's my concern. Love builds. Love builds. We can give flowers and kind words rather than angry, judgmental uh, words. Love serves. Those that focus on uh, serving each other rather than winning arguments are the happiest individuals. They carry with them the, the greatest amount of joy. Thus the verse in John 15, 13, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. That is serving his brother or sister. That is serving. Christians who have more than faith, love, are fulfilled. They have connections. They have blessings. Uh, there is no time for negative energy. And that is one of the things that Bob Goff does so well. He says that instead of focusing on who's loving and who's not, get busy doing God's business. And you'll have so much to do, you, you won't have time for that negative energy that's always looking and and trying to figure out what, what others are, are doing. Uh, I read a book recently by John Gordon. Said, I think that was The Power of Positive Leadership. And he said he did a study of I don't know how many leaders. The happiest, most productive teams were those that were focused on serving each other and those that they were leading. And that is not my words. That's just That is a quote that I got from him. But he noticed that the happiest groups were those that were focused on serving each other. Now, we, I could have done a long list. Sometimes making firewood is what happens. Sometimes serving on the food committee is what happens. It's those areas where you're, no one's really seeing it, quietly serving. Sometimes it's offering a smile or a drink of water to your neighbor or a discouraged individual in their path, in your path. But there's one thing that I am going to, I hope you write this down and you, you, you think about it wherever you go. Christian love always declares itself in action. Christian love always declares itself in action. It's visible, it's something you see. And I guess you could say that um, if you don't see it, it's not there. Three basic ways that love is expressed. Action, doing something, serving by doing something, speech, saying a kind word or a love or loving things. And the third one I thought of, and there's maybe a thousand others that you could say, but writing something to someone expressing your love or sharing the concerns that they have. Those are three basic things that, that you can uh, use to, to, to share love. And hatred is expressed kind of in the opposite direction. You can write ugly things, you can say ugly things, and you can have actions that are ugly. It's hatred. The, I think the true test of Christian love is derived from our connection with God and knowing that we have a loving God. I think fake love, whether it's our love for God or each other, is exposed when the pressure is on. You know, sometimes people get squeezed and suddenly they're asked a question. Maybe they've done something wrong and suddenly they pop and they're kind of angry all of a sudden. Well, that was there all along. It was just exposed now that maybe they don't have the love that they said they, they had. If love is fake, it's like the Pharisees had. They loved those that loved them. They, they were happy f to be around those that expressed or uh, support for them. But anyone that gave them opposition, they disengaged and they, they really just pushed him away. And that is not, not Christian love. So what I, I'd like to end with this. What do you do if you're in a situation, a marriage, a church, and the environment around you is all takers? And no one is really loving. No one is really kind. Many times I hear people say they, they leave church, they end their relations, and they say, well, they, those folks, they just, they just don't love. And you know, I shouldn't, well, yeah, I had a man, a long conversation with a man yesterday, and he is, 
really close to leaving what he calls organized Christianity. And he said, I just think that, and I don't know what percentage, but most of the people that go to church Sunday morning aren't really Christians. And that was his assessment. And I doubt if I convinced him otherwise, but I, I at least talked. And, and I, I love this man. I, I have a connection with him. And it was his sort of excuse to say, I am not going to be a part of a church. And then he kind of had his, and we, I'll leave it at that. But this is what I'd like to do, and, and this is the challenge I'd like to leave with you. So if you are in an environment where you think there's a lack of love, let's put a different spin on it this morning. Let, let's think in the other direction. So I'm not loved whether that's your marriage, your, and I hope that we don't have that idea that we're just going to leave, we're going to work on it. But sometimes when it comes to doing church or other things, we just, well, I'll just cut ties. Let's, let me put a different spin on that. Or so the other, I guess the other option is that sometimes people will fight. They will fight where they're at. They will say more harsh things. And let me say, you can never fight fire with fire. It doesn't work. You can never say it harshly enough so that people love you, or I haven't noticed that. If it works for others, maybe that's something I haven't mastered yet. But let me put this spin on it. If you see that the environment you are in, whether it's your church, your neighborhood, your marriage, your family, if you see that the environment that, that you're in isn't what God would want, instead of thinking about leaving, I would ask you to think about this. What can I do to bring change to this environment to improve it? You know, it seems like my, my uh, mind, and I don't know if you've read this, but it, I've read this, that when we are in an environment where people are quick to do the put down and, and they're like, well, you know, they... They are here, and someone has said it activates the reptilian part of our brain, and all we can do is focus on survival. And I think as Christians, we ought to be beyond that. I, I don't, I, when people start defending what they're doing and just with no let up, then I, I think it, it tells a story, put it that way. Again, I'll, I'll put this to you. If you think the environment you're in, wherever that's at, isn't the way it should be, then see what you can do to improve that environment. And I know it takes a team. I know that may, sometimes people say, well, it takes more than just me. And I know that. I understand that. So that's the other, that's the counter message. But I remind you at the end of this Romans 12, 21 does say, it's not talking about love, but it does say, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. And I know sometimes it feels hopeless. I'm not saying that, that it's always possible. I'm not saying that at all. But I would like to think that as the salt and light of the earth, we would focus more time on seeing what can I do to improve the situation rather than either walking away, becoming angry, losing our salvation, whatever it is. And I think, I think, if a whole community does that, we become, if we are not, we become a thriving church, a thriving community, or whatever you want to fill in the blanks. But let it be known this morning again, God is love. And we were all, at one point or another, number 100. We have no reason to be proud of where we're at or who we are. Only we're a vessel in God's hand to show love. Why don't we stand and have a word of prayer? Father, just pause at the end of this, this service and just pray, Lord, that if there's someone here that has not felt your love, 
has not felt the, the, just the pure joy of knowing that despite the circumstances around them, you love them. I pray that you would meet those needs this morning, wherever they're at. And I pray, Father, that you would help us to have open eyes and, and hearts to know how we can do better, how our fruit of love can grow as we go through life. Make us wise, Lord. Give us wisdom. We need help in so many areas, but Father, you have great plans. We're not under the law. Thank you, Lord, that we have. The options are unlimited if you are in the mix. And so we ask for your presence. We ask that you would guide us. And we know, we know that you have a love for each one of us that goes beyond what we can even express. And so we thank you for that. We pray your blessing upon each one. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.